Welcome back, it's Pedram. Uh, we got a heavy topic today. My guest uh, was a normal human being, grown up in a normal life, and then she found out that her father went to prison for being a serial killer, a famous one at that. And so what does that do to your life? What does that do to your psyche? What does that do to your, your personality and your reputation? We're about to find out. Uh, a tremendous story. So um, oh. I'm, you know, I applaud you on bringing it out um, and Thank making you. it public. It's Thank not, you. you know. Yeah, it was a this. This was a lot of work, as you know, with your book. I, it just, I kind of got, I got tired of it. <laughs> Think, you know, because it was just such an arduous process, and just digging everything out and all the interviews. Uh, I, I produce TV shows. I'm executive producer, and it's. It was probably, this was harder than creating a TV show, I would say. Sure. In some ways. And I saw that you create some documentaries, some films as well. Yeah, yeah. There's, uh, there's a lot of work that goes into all of it. And so, you know, life is hard work, um, but yeah. you know, ma making, <laughs> a, making yeah. a book is personal. It really, really mm -hmm. is. So we're actually, we're actually rolling. I'm going to roll right into it because this is, oh, we're, okay. very, we're very conversational. Um, yeah. You know, we're, uh, you know, your story, your father, I mean, a lot of us, a lot of us have, you know, issues with our parents growing up, but you had a, a very specific case that is uh, not usual. <laughs> and yeah. so, yeah, what, what, what's up? With, what, what was up with dad? So at age 15, I found out that my dad was living a double life. Uh, I had no idea until my mom brought me and my siblings together to explain that my dad was arrested for serial murder. And that's when my whole life, you know, came unraveled. It was, I was 15, I was a freshman, I had to go to school the next day, and of course everybody had heard about the news that my dad was known as the Happy Face serial killer. And why the Happy Face, is, why he got that moniker is that he would leave clues to the media and to the authorities uh, with, with bodies. He would leave uh, notes or symbols at rest stops that would give clues of where you could find pieces of evidence and he would always smile, uh, sign it with a smiley face. My goodness. So, yeah, and this was in 1995. So it was a while ago, it was a couple decades ago, but um, you know, that's something you just don't forget. You know? <laughs> no. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> to put it lightly. <laughs> you're, okay, so you're a normal kid going off to school. Um, what was your relationship like with your father prior to this news breaking? Was he a normal guy? Was he a loving dad? Yeah, yeah, he was an amazing dad. Um, I would say he was amazing. And the way I, why I would say he was amazing is that he was a hands-on dad. Uh, my mom actually called him Disneyland dad because he was full of fun and laughter. He's charming. He uh, was attentive. He would play games. I mean, I remember him just putting me on his back, piggyback. He would make up games with a blanket. He would put me in the middle of a blanket and like rustle me up and make it into a ride. I mean, it was, it was I have good memories of playing with my dad. He was generous. He would uh, buy me gifts while I was on the road. He was a long haul truck driver. So he was gone for long periods of time and uh, he, he was generous in the fact uh, that I always felt that I was loved and thought about. So he'd come home, his home life, his, his personal life was good and it was healthy and you know the facade was great. The facade was amazing and it, it duped everybody. It really duped everyone. So, and, and so did you guys get to unpack what happened? Like did he kind of disclose like where he was at in his other life? Uh, in some sort of testimony, like he's driving trucks and something pisses him off. I mean, what 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 drove him to be a serial killer? You know, I think that was something that was started long before he started to kill. I think that I don't think he was born that way uh, because I have home videos of him growing up. He was a normal he was a normal kid. Um, I think that a combination of events took place, and it just was a snowball. So maybe maybe it was a perfect storm of nature and environment. So nature and nurture. Yeah, no kidding. Dad's got this double life. Um, he's off trucking, and he becomes a serial murderer. And so you know that that's a story in and of itself. And I'm sure that you've told that story many times. But what I'm more interested in is you. Um, all of a sudden, you become known as the daughter of a serial killer. What the hell is that like? I mean, just to be defined by that label, 
is difficult because that label has a lot of meanings or associations and negative associations. So I, I would tell people that I was guilty by association in the sense that uh, my dad's crimes had somehow, you know, they have an effect on me because now people think that maybe I knew something or if I didn't know something, maybe I'm like my dad. What about my DNA? There's so many parts about it. Like what creates a serial killer? We still have yet to find the exact answers on that. And so I think with that blank space of not knowing, people fill in it, you know, fill in that blank and uh, they make their own assumptions. You're a 15-year-old girl in America. What part of America? Washington State. Washington State um, High School which is already tough as hell and judgmental. From junior high to high mm -hmm. school, it's, it's rough. And now suddenly yeah. you get this label? Ouch. Yeah, I, I mean, my last name was unique, the last name Jesperson, just the people knew who I was. And so I ended up changing schools. I ended up going and hiding. And that's how I coped, is I, I just ran away from the problem. And I didn't talk about it. Yeah, uh, how could you? I mean, did you even have the mechanism, like the coping mechanisms there? Did you have support? Were there therapists to come in and be like, hey, listen, it's not your fault. Y you need to think about it this way. I mean, that's, that's such a delicate time in, in, in a young girl's life, right? Yeah, I didn't have any support. I didn't have any counselors. I didn't have um, my family to really talk to about it because everybody, when this trauma happened to my family, we all fragmented. Uh, I went my own way and coped with the trauma my way. My mom coped with it her own way. My siblings coped with their own way, but we never unified. And that was half of the hurdle, I would say. The other half is just, just being isolated in that problem outside of the family. The community isolated us, you know. Yeah, yeah, and ostracized in a lot of ways, mm -hmm. right? Like, well, if, you, you know, if, if that's your dad, then who are you? You must, you know, you, mm -hmm. must, you too must be a monster, which is absolutely unfair. Yeah. And that's how we were treated. And so I thought, oh, this is a shame that I have to carry. This is a burden that um, I have to somehow make a restitution, amends to people when I didn't do anything wrong. Yeah. So then what? You go into hiding. You change schools. Mm -hmm. um, does your name follow you to the next school? Like how, how easy was it to actually hide this or did it just keep coming out? Uh, thankfully, it was easy to hide because the trial was more high profile in other states. And so in Washington state, uh, there there wasn't any victims in my um, city. So I was able to escape a lot of the media attention at that time. That was before Google. That was before, you know, all these major online news sources. And so it was it was just the local media that would be covering it. And since the trial started to happen in another state, the attention started to go away, which was amazing. And so I was able to outrun it. Uh, and also, you know, teenagers weren't really, um, the teenagers, at least I was around, weren't really into the current events. Hmm. And so uh, all this all this while, uh, dad is in the clink, like they, they, they locked him up, put him in jail. Are you in communication with him at, a, at any point? Or is this just like, you're done? At that point, I was done. I was just trying to focus on getting you know, my grades up, kind of keeping up with schoolwork, and I just had my head focused, and, and every day I went to school focused until summertime. That summer when the trial happened with my dad, I had a lot of questions, of course. I wanted to know, did he really commit these crimes? Um, it wasn't proven yet, and so I went to visit him in jail, and when I went to visit him in jail, the first thing he said to me is, when I saw him, he said, you know, Melissa, or he actually called me Missy. He's like, you know, Missy, my best advice, you need to change your last name. And when he said that, I knew that was an admission of guilt. He did that it. That he did it. He did it. And at that point, I mean, do you walk away? Do you say, Dad, I don't know you? Do you get into trying to forgive him? I mean, I, you know, that, that's just, it's so much. Yeah, right at that point, um, I was terrified terrified because I was a young girl and I felt very alone in the world for the first time that I had to make my own way. Because when he said, you know, you need to change your last name, I also got the sense that you're on your own and you need to take care of yourself and, you know, that that's what it is. I don't have a dad any longer. I don't have protection any longer. I'm on my own. And so with that response, 
also with his admission of guilt in that form and then feeling like I was alone, I just, I was in shock and started crying and, and was terrified. And that's it? Did you walk out and basically break communication? Did you try to communicate with them? Yeah. You broke? Yeah, I, I broke communication and just, just had to focus on how do I survive today? How do I survive tomorrow? It, it, there wasn't a lot of future planning, more of survival for the day. Emotionally, you know. Yeah, and what, what got you through it? Um, I just knew that if I took it a day at a time and just handled the things that were right in front of me, that I could, I could somehow make it through. And, and I wasn't thinking making it through long term. I was thinking making it, making it for the day. That was my only goal. And when I made it a day, and then the days turned into a week, then over some time and as the trial progressed, I was able to make longer term goals, such as graduating high school. And that was a big goal for me because I knew when I was a legal adult, I'd be able to actually be in charge of my destiny more so than I was as a minor. Uh, where's mom all this while? Are you still living with her or did she just... Uh, I was living with my mom and my stepdad. My mom remarried a very abusive man, uh, and so I was living at, technically living at home with her. But I would, I was kind of feral. I would, I would stay at other friends' houses for long periods of time, and their parents would take care of me. And and so that was actually the silver lining in this whole mess is that being in other people's homes gave me a frame of reference that was different than than the home I was brought in. And because of seeing other lifestyles, other ways of being, it actually gave me coping strategies and tools to, to create what I wanted. Yeah, and that's, I mean, it's amazing that people are there and that, that supportive. Mm -hmm. now, I'm assuming these people didn't know the history that you came from. These are new people in a new town kind of thing. Uh, these are new people, and I got to know their, their children, and they just took me in for who I was, knowing what they knew, which was limited. They didn't know all the details about my dad. And when I felt safe, I would start to you know, to tell them a little bit here and there. But um, it, it always was scary to let people know the full story. Yeah, that's a deep, dark secret. And you, mm -hmm. you presumably, they would judge you and you'd be right, right back in that place um, where you know, you're know you ostracized and you gotta get the hell out of there. So Yeah, yeah. absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, that's a, that's a tough move. So so then how did you start coming? Your, your, your book is called Whole, which is appropriate. Um, how did you start coming whole, having been in such a tumultuous, uh, just crazy blender of a, a, of a life event? Yeah, so the number one question I had leaving or walking away from the trauma of my childhood, it actually, I think my sole question to myself was, can I ever be whole? Could I ever feel good enough within myself? And could I ever be strong enough within myself? And I always thought that there's a limit to how whole you could be depending on what you've gone through. I, that's what I used to think. I used to think that if you suffered a massive trauma like being molested or something that, that you're forever tainted by that experience changed by that experience and that you can never heal that's what I used to think and that's what I used to think about my um, my childhood with my dad until I realized that you can be complete that you're already complete and that gave me a new perspective and so that's how the book whole came to be is it's also an acronym but it's also a state of being that you're really claiming the whole wholeness that you already are. Yeah. Um, did it take a while to come around to that? Is it something that kind of organically developed? Did you have any aha moments? It was, it was a journey and it wasn't something that, so I started the journey with the question, can I be whole? Can I ever be fully healed from my past? And I wanted the answer. And, and part of me feared that if I couldn't be healed, then I would suffer the rest of my life in this incomplete state of being. And that, that obviously would be not a good place. Sure. <laughs> I was hoping that's not the answer. I was hoping that wholeness was the answer. Um, so I was seeking that. And so on this journey, I was looking for experts, people who knew more than I did about trauma. 
and I was looking for how do you become whole? How do you feel whole? How do you stop doubting yourself? How do you have confidence? How do you center yourself in the middle of a storm? And so this path, this question led me on the journey and led me to experts. Uh, what age were you when you kind of got on this journey? I would say this is, this is probably sad, but I was an adult. It wasn't until my daughter, so I, I graduated, so to go back, I graduated from high school, I went to college, I got married, I had children, and I just kind of, I went through the motions of life, and it wasn't until my daughter came home from school learning about family history and the family tree, and she realized there was a hole in this family tree. She knew who my husband's side you know, the parents, but not on my side. She didn't understand who my father was. Mm. And so when she came home, she's like, everybody has a daddy. Where's your daddy? And her question prompted me to go on this journey. But that was the question within myself is, can I fully be healed? And how do I tell my daughter? Yeah. How long did it take to tell her the truth? Um, so as she grew, I gave her knowledge along the way. So it wasn't like a sit down, like birds and the bees kind of talk where you just kind of lay it all at one time. It was a gradual process. It was, you know, your grandfather, Keith, and we just call him Keith, by the way. He's, he's taken that, we've taken that label of grandfather off. Um, I said he's serving prison time. He lives in Oregon. So it started with that. Then it started with he did bad things to people. Then it explained like he actually took people's lives. As she got older, she would learn more. So it wasn't it was line upon line over time, not one big big chunk big thrown at her. Shock, yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. uh, is Keith still alive? Yeah. yeah, he's serving multiple life sentences in Salem, Oregon. Have you sent him a copy of this book? I haven't. I know that he watches my my interviews that I do with people in the sense that I work for Crime Watch Daily with Warner Brothers, and I go in, I interview crime, you know, uh, trauma survivors, women who have been assaulted by serial killers and survived, or um, you know, rape rape survivors. I also, with my own show, Monster My Family, I'm a bridge between the perpetrator's family and the victim's family, so I unite. I unite serial killer families and mass killer families to victims' families. Wow. And so that's my role. And so with my role of connecting both both sides of, of a crime together, that helped me create the book whole as well. So you, you know, in the tradition I come from, the al alchemist turns lead to gold. So you mm -hmm. chose a career where you took this, this extremely painful event in your life and are now serving a role in society where you're helping other people through that. And, and, and in that service, do you feel like that's part of your healing? Absolutely. I actually feel like before I started my career in interviewing families and bridging families and putting them together, before that, I felt a huge void in my life. I felt like everything that I suffered was in vain. Like there was no meaning in this senselessness. And to me, I need to create meaning out of this senseless act that my father created. And, and so that's, that's what I did is I thought, how could I be of service? How can I fix things? And I found that a natural, um, just in my nature, I can, I'm good at bringing people together. And that happened to happen with my, with my work in TV. Uh, drugs and alcohol, those seem like a pretty good choice for someone who's been through what you'd been through, right? And um, I'm sure they were there and had the opportunity to present themselves to you. How did you not fall to a dark place to go into kind of self-medication in that, in that capacity? You know, it, it's definitely alluring because you want, I want to numb out so many times because feeling the pain I think is half the... I think it's half the, the trauma is just feeling it. And it's easier to repress it and just stuff it away and not look at it or dismiss what you're going through. Um, but that will never be a permanent solution. But for me, just to be honest and candid, I, it was my upbringing. My dad put the fear in me about using drugs and alcohol. Um, he he absolutely terrified me and said that it would, it would just lead to, to more problems. And so with that, 
with that mindset, I thought if I have alcohol or drugs, that I'll just create more of an issue, and I already had enough issues to deal with. Okay, so that that that's an interesting legacy that he also left because you know a lot yeah. of, a lot of people go there. Mm-hmm. A lot of people go yeah. there. So so what is the kind of gestalt of coming whole from your perspective, having been through what you've been through? How does one who has had some sort of tragedy, some sort of really serious um, life event like this even go about picking up the pieces and coming whole? Yeah, so whole is actually five milestones. So it's the W-H-O-L-E. And so the W stands for watch the storm, which is how we respond in the middle of a crisis. The very first initial point of, of trauma. And we have, you know, we've been told we have the fight or flight response. Um, but I have found that we can be reactive or responsive, and there's a difference there. And so in that chapter, I go between being reactive and responsive, and I found that in the middle of trauma, that's the first case of, that's the first instance where you can create more of a problem for yourself. And I know we could probably go into minor stories of how we've re- overreacted in a problem. And, and so that's where I separate that out, being responsive and reactive. And watching the storm is giving yourself time to become aware of truly what the problem is and then create a plan for being responsive. And then H is heal your heart. And that's being aware of the, the pain that has been been inflicted upon you. Being, you know, not dismissing it. I think that's what we tend to do is diminish it. Like for myself, I had to wrap my head around, you know, my dad's double life. And and that that's a big step. And then O is open your mind. Um, that's being aware of other opportunities. L is leverage your power and E's elevate your spirit, which I think you could probably relate a lot with E, elevate your spirit. Uh, it goes into meditation. It goes into other practices to help you every day, tools that you can use right now. Yeah, yeah. And so at what point did you start layering those on um, and, and actually realizing that they were helpful? Uh, I, I think that... Just, you know, every day when you, I I think we all could relate to coping with a problem and and looking back with hindsight and say, you know, I wish I would have handled that differently. And for me, worrying was a big problem for myself. I would try to control everything and I would worry and I would plan and strategize and that's not a way to live. And and so I had to find coping mechanisms and self-talk. A talk, a way to talk to myself that would self soothe me, a self repair. That's why it's called a guide to self repair. Is I needed um, a way to nurse myself, and th- this book is really the the coping strategies that I have found from experts that help you to nurse yourself to wholeness. Um, did you try EMDR, thought field therapy, tapping? Did you try any of the kind of the new psychological things? I'm curious to see what mm-hmm. actually worked along this huge gestalt of things that people try and, and report success with. Yeah, so I stuck with with scientific strategies such as meditation. That we we it's proven you could be 10 percent happier. You can you can find solace with that and. So I've tried different methods, but obviously every person is unique. And I found for meditation, why that was such a strong tool is that it calmed my mind and it actually got me out of the trauma for even 10 minutes, five minutes, even a minute, a second, you know, whatever I can do to alleviate that moment of pain. And meditation was instant relief. And so I focused on the science and the strategy of meditation because of that. Great. When you talk about leverage, you kind of alluded to this, but you're really good at bringing people together. And so is that the skill set, is that the kind of personality trait that you look to leverage to, to kind of judo flip this energy and say, okay, well, what, what can I do to be a productive part of society? Yeah, it's, it's, it's answering the question that we can all ask for, of ourselves is how can I take this and transform it? Um, and just being aware that you have choices is a big part of that. Mm-hmm. And then looking at your choices, what, what do I have? today. And so there's a lot of stories in there about women who who are at the brink of having nothing or lost everything and how do you start from ground zero? And that's what leverage your power is is realizing 
that every moment you have a choice and then once you make a choice you're building upon these choices and you're creating a new a new out mm -hmm. and then as you do so opportunities emerge and you see things more clearly how hard was it I mean you must have lived under this dark cloud for so long right and um, mm -hmm. I mean is it gone or are there days where you got to just go through your process and kind of work your way out of it because, you know, that was in your history? You know, I think that they say, you know, time heals all wounds. And I would say I, I don't feel like it heals my wounds. I feel like it takes away the pain of, of the wounds. So it, it, it doesn't, it's not a sharp, um, I don't, I don't cry as often as I used to. I, it's given me greater empathy. Uh, I guess I have residue, absolutely. I cope with the residue of, of my dad being who he is. And every day I'm learning something new about what that is. Um, I know that I have, my, my main residue is anxiety. And that is something that I cope with every day and, and trying to manage. And I have found for myself that the more I immerse myself in the things I'm afraid of, the stronger I become and the less fear I have the next time I do it. So, I mean, that's, that's something I cope with every day from my past. What's your mom doing now? She's still around? Yes, my mom's still around. She is actually, so she, she did something similar to me. She went into, um, she went to college and she studied uh, social work and now she works for the Salvation Army helping women transition off the streets with their children and give them uh, she provides temporary housing for them. Good for her. How long, yeah. how long did it take her to come around and, and really kind of see the light on that? You know, for a, for a while. I think for a while there she thought that there wasn't much she, she can contribute. And, you know, she's inspired me, and I know I've inspired her. Uh, and together just knowing that we can choose. You know, we could absolutely choose what we want to do going forward. You know, something big for me, too, is that coming forward with my story. For a long time it was a secret and it wasn't until the pain became so great of carrying that secret that I came forward. And when I came forward, and that's a big part of this book too, is like once you once you talk about your secrets, it no longer has power over you. Mm. And that's what I had to learn about my dad carrying that as a secret is that when I released that and I told people, hey, this is who he is, it's not me, and, you know, some people judged me, but I realized that this was just my life to live. And, and if I lived and was happy based on the opinions of other people, then I'm, I'm going to be perpetually stuck in that place. That's a heavy burden. It, it is a real mm -hmm. heavy burden carrying something like that around. How, so how did, yeah. how did you come out with it? Like what was, what was the, the medium through which you, you basically disclosed this to the world? So when my daughter asked me, you know, she said, everybody has a daddy, where's your daddy? And I went to the library, actually, and I looked for books. I don't know what I was looking for. I was trying to find a book like how to tell your your children these hard things. And so one day, um, I, I couldn't find any resources. And so one day I was I was turning the, the channels and I, I, I saw Dr. Phil talking to these two adults that were divorcing and he was defending the children. And I thought, oh my gosh, I need to, I just need to talk to him. Maybe you'll have advice for me. And so I wrote to him and the producers responded back to me and they invited me on the Get Real Retreat. And so I had to make a choice if I wanted to come on national TV and tell everybody who my father was. Um, but I thought the reward would be I would get advice on how to help myself tell my children this and and also I thought like how I might get help for myself to really understand what happened to me um, and so I went on the show and I was terrified I was afraid that by outing myself like coming out that my husband would a lose his job from his corporate America with UPS and I thought he would lose his job if people found out and then also I was afraid of how my friends would respond or and people that I, I worked with in the community and so I went on the show and when it came out everybody was talking about it and I realized it wasn't as scary as I thought you know there were some people who thought that it was ridiculous that it would air my dirty laundry on national TV and 
that, that they seem to be angrier about that than who I was related to. Um, and then some people were really compassionate. They were like, wow, I can't believe you went through what you did. If I would have known, I would have been there for you. And that was really surprising. But that's how I came forward. And ever since, you know, I never had to carry that that burden of of people not knowing anymore. Well, that's a, you know, it's, it's a different day, a different time, right? So the coping skills yeah. of the woman who showed up on the TV show had far surpassed that of the girl who got shell-shocked into, you know, running away mm -hmm. and so Absolutely. you know and and most of us the stuff that we're harboring comes from an era where we just couldn't cope we didn't have the tools to deal with the news that the trauma the event that happened and then mm -hmm. it's just it's heavier to carry it than it is to release it it seems huh absolutely absolutely so what would your advice be to someone who has a similar background, maybe maybe not as traumatic, maybe just as traumatic, maybe more, but is listening to this, holding on to something right now that is heavy. You know, I hope that they would hear my story and know what I've gone through and know that it's possible to actually find confidence and joy and meaning again in your life. And I think one thing that has surprised me through this whole journey is that you can never anticipate the wonder that and the miracles that will come into your life when you open yourself up to it. I think that is truly the gift and the blessing of this life is that when you open yourself up, they're right when they say the universe has your back. The universe will open up to you and provide beautiful gifts and people and situations and, and just miracles into your life. What kind of psychological slash social cultural safety net had you woven prior to coming out with this information that, that you know, created a supportive environment? Because, you know, I, someone tomorrow is going to run out there and make an announcement at their elementary school that, you know, <laughs> they did this thing and they may or may not be um, tactically, you know, appropriate in doing so, right? So, yeah, yeah. So, so in sense, so you're asking like if they have a secret, a, a very dark secret, and they want to tell people. Is that what you're asking? Yeah, um, if someone's got a, a dark secret, like is there is there a way to do this right so that it doesn't backfire, and 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 you know how to do it so that it actually works to ease the pain and 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 relieve the burden versus create more drama um, and and you know safeguard against that really. Yeah, I think we all know the temperature of the friends that are in our lives. I think we all know like who you could tell, who you can't tell. Um, I think you know the opinions and the judgments of people that are around you. So I, I chose for myself to go in a space where obviously it was Dr. Phil and it was on a huge platform and I didn't really trust the platform but I knew that it would out just coming out was good for me. So it, it's very unique to the individual. If you feel like you could tell a friend at first, if you need to tell a counselor at first, if you need to tell your mom at first, you know, that's, it's all dependent on the situation. Obviously, if um, other people have economic ties to keeping you in that secret, then that's obviously mm. not the person to go to. Yeah, or, or personal ties. I mean, if they're complicit mm -hmm. in some sort of yeah. secret you're trying to come out with. Yeah, like for example, I met a woman who was was sexually tortured growing up and her parents, her mom and her stepdad had killed their former spouses. And so the mom allowed the stepdad to abuse her in and use her as a pawn um, and she, she the mom kept this a secret because the step the the grandfather said, if you tell that I'm molesting your daughter, I will tell that you killed your former spouse. Now, obviously, that's a major extreme case, but in, that's just an instance where this secret was allowed to stay in their household because of other secrets. So, mm -hmm. obviously, you know, I mean, that's on the, on the reference there. That's pretty extreme, but that gives you a sense. Mm -hmm. If other people have, you know, a personal agenda, I think you could sense it or know. You know. Yeah, and navigate those waters. I mean, there's a, there's a lot mm -hmm. of that kind of secret swapping. 
uh, out mm -hmm. there, right? So, so absolutely, you know, it's political. Absolutely. It's political. Well, I, I think that uh, you are incredibly brave for taking the step. I don't know if you had a choice because now you can live again, and you know, get yeah. a breath of fresh air. Um, but this is this is remarkable. This is really powerful work. And um, you know, the book is called Whole: A Guide to Self Repair. Uh, Melissa Moore. Um, and uh, yeah, this is. The, the dark underbelly of the secrets no one wants to talk about. People have these lives. I mean, you're you're a nice nice lady, a mom, and you know you have this history. But you know what? It, yeah. You didn't you didn't deserve that. But it is what it is, it, and you were dealt that hand. So the question is, how did you come whole? And I think you have a lot of really like really sage wisdom in this book. So thank you for oh, thank, you. thank you for sharing it. No, thank you, and, and I hope that it helps other people. The journey to writing the book has been helpful to me because of the experts and the, the tools that it's provided to me. So knowing that it's been useful in my life, I, I trust that it'll be useful to, to many other people. Melissa, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. So looking at what Melissa did, uh, we can all pick up and move on and make ourselves agents of service. I'm really proud of her and what she's done. Uh, I thought this was a fascinating story and I think it's something that we all need to kind of come to terms with is that, you know, life ain't always peachy. So the question is, where do you go from there? How do you fight? How do you grow? How do you resolve? Uh, it's important for us to look at the, the reality of it and grow with it. So I uh, hope you enjoyed it. Let me know what you think. It's obviously a heavy topic. Check out my previous shows, subscribe where you are, and I will see you next week.